Well, good morning. It is a pleasure and a privilege once again to be here. Thank you for coming. Uh, if you're a guest with us here this morning, we are thrilled that you're here. There is a blue card in your program or in the seat back in front of you, and we do encourage you to fill that out, uh, to let us know. Mark the little box that says first-time guest. We'd love to send you a note, a gift, a thank you for being here because it is a very big deal. Now, last week was the July 4th weekend, and while many of you were away enjoying vacation in some very cold water and weather, Matt Herndon, um, he was up in Lake Michigan, he told me it was 55 degree water. So you leave the church and that's what you get. So there you go. Um, it was always 70 when I lived there and swam in the lake, Matt. I'm sorry about that. Um, some of you were away traveling. We began a new series last week called Risk, What Is Your Life Worth? And in last week's opening message in the four-part message series, we introduced this topic of risk, risk, and we defined it. And we defined it as this. Risk is an action that exposes us, you and me, to the possibility of loss or injury. Then we looked at a passage in Luke 9 uh, that Jesus himself spoke, just three or four verses in Luke chapter 9. And what we found out was that while our salvation comes through faith and is a gift from God through his grace, in order to fully receive this salvation, we have to surrender our life to God. And that surrendering in the salvation process is a very risky step. Not only that, but as we say yes to God and we begin our journey with him as he's been pursuing us, and we say yes to God initially, he begins to lovingly and yet very purposefully bring risk opportunities into our life to test us, not as a means of punishment, but to train us to increase our faith, and to ultimately draw us closer to him. And so risk takes place. Risk occurs. Situations where it feels like we have to take a step of risk are from the Lord to build our faith. And ultimately, if we can follow him through that, scary as it might be, to bring us closer to him and to grow in him, which is ultimately every follower of Jesus' desire, to grow closer to the Father, to become more like Jesus. Well, to follow up on last week and our kind of general overview of what risk is and God's being a a risk-taking and a risk-providing God, this week we're going to look more deeply into the obstacles that deter us and prevent us from taking risks that God is, in fact, asking us to take. And to introduce this morning's message, as is almost always the case, we have a little video for you. Well, last year, NFL rookie linebacker Chris Borland had one of the best years at linebacker a a first-year NFL player can have, considering he didn't start playing until halfway through the season. Uh, He set several team records on defense for his play and was highly regarded as a future NFL superstar when the year ended. Being a star player in the NFL is filled with benefits that many, many people we know would envy. Our country has come to esteem and elevate football to the highest level of entertainment. In American sports, the NFL is king. Its superstars receive millions of dollars in salaries and endorsements, and they can achieve enormous levels of fame and acclaim. Knowing that, and loving the sport of football, which almost all of them do, tens of thousands of young men do everything possible in their high school and college years to try to make it into the NFL. This mentality, this do-whatever-it-takes, is seen in a recent quote from a, an NFL safety, Chris Conte, who used to play for Chicago, who now uh, plays for Tampa Bay. He said the following. He said something very different to Chris Borland. I'd rather have the experience of playing in the NFL and die 10 to 15 years earlier than not play in the NFL and have a long life. I don't really look toward my life after football. I'll figure things out when I get there. Yet if you're a football fan, you know the growing awareness in society about the dangers that football and concussions, which are so common in football, can cause. Hundreds of former NFL players are now suing the NFL for close to a billion dollars collectively for medical care and other needs that they have. Because the NFL became aware of some potential damaging uh, 
results from medical research, and they allegedly did not disclose it to, or it's been proven they didn't disclose it to these players, and thus let them continue playing. Now, if you're not a football fan, let me get you up to speed here. If this is all news to you, this is just kind of a real quick summary of the whole deal. It turns out that ramming your head into other people and into the ground repeatedly is hazardous to one's health. <laughs> you might not have stopped and realized that, but you keep doing it. Time after time, danger can occur. And as we saw in the interview, Chris Borland has decided that at the end of the year that the risks of injury were too great to continue playing the sport. Now, obviously, just from listening to him, Chris is not your run-of-the-mill NFL superstar. He saw the potential millions and the celebrity that comes with being an NFL star, and yet he decided that the risks to his health were not worth these potential, and in his case, likely rewards. Now, Chris Borland's recent decision is a great illustration of two major obstacles that present themselves in the face of risk, obstacles being the topic of our message this morning. The first obstacle is pretty basic, and it's this. How do we know what are the right risks we should take versus the wrong risks we could take? How do we know the difference between the right risks we should take and the wrong risks we could take? Every day you and I face decisions that are regularly choosing one risk over another risk. For Chris Borland, does his risk of losing millions of dollars and the fame that come with that it's a very successful NFL career, successful, and, and the benefits of that, how that enhances your life, is that preeminent? Or does he risk diminished health and suffering in the years after his football career would end? And if you know these, you see some of these older former players, they truly are hurting and suffering. This is not an easy choice. And it's, not, and it's a choice that every NFL player has to make based on their belief system, their understanding, their values, which is the right risk to choose. Often this is a dilemma that you and I find ourselves in in our own lives, in our own lives, following Jesus or just living life normally. We're going along, doing the best to try to honor God and do the best with the life that he's given us, and all of a sudden something happens, something unexpected. Let's say a relative gets in a financial crisis, and we could help them, but if we help them what they needed, it would set us back financially from where we are. We don't quite have the savings in place that we want. We don't quite have the nest egg and the extra available. So if we help them, we would be hindering ourselves, putting ourselves at risk. And honestly, they've not been the best steward of their money over the years. And I'm not sure if I help them, might I even be enabling their foolish stewardship and conduct with regard to their finances? Yet, they're my family. And irrespective of what they've done wrong, they're in need. And this might very well be an opportunity that God is bringing into my life to love them in action and to be obedient to him in this decision. So what do we do? What's the, where are the risks and what decision do we make based on the options available to us? In another scenario, you've got a job here in St. Louis. It's a pretty good job. It's not a perfect job. It's not the best job. But they take care of you fairly well, and, and you really seem to be doing well where God has planted you geographically. Then through some contacts or just some, some networking, you hear about this great job opportunity out of state. Your initial inquiries are very exciting, and it would be the career advancement that you've been looking for locally but not been able to find. However, if you take the job, you will leave your friends, family, your church community, who have really been there to help you this past year, and this past year has been really difficult. God has done some things, some growing in my life, and this would be a really risky time to leave on a spiritual level. And also, starting over is so hard. It took so long to find and build these relationships to start over again and to re-go through this process again. I just can't imagine that. Also, how might, how might my decision to move impact my family, my children? Once again, there are risks in the going, and there are risks in the not going. What do you choose? How do we know the difference between right risks or wrong risks? This aspect of risk assessment is generally a mental one. It's a logical one. 
It's based on finding the best amount of information we can, weighing the risk and rewards of both, both positions, and trying to make an informed decision that is best for us and our family, whatever those terms might mean for the individual who is saying, I need to make this decision which is best for me or my family. More importantly, though, when we have these options, what does God want? God's ways are not always obvious to us. They're not always the common sense decision that the world or our, even our friends who are quote-unquote Christian would recommend us to take. God is known to ask us to walk a narrow path, a contrarian's way, if you will. So this is the first obstacle. Which is the right risk to take? Because there's risk involved in both of these. The second obstacle is much less logical and much more emotional in nature. And as a result, the second obstacle is almost always a much bigger and more um, challenging obstacle to overcome. Anybody have an idea what the second obstacle is? Fear. Fear. All of us to some degree, and some of us to great degrees, are mobilized or immobilized by fear. We don't know where it comes from, and we don't know why it impacts us so strongly, but without fail, when facing some important decision and hopeful opportunities, we are hesitant and we back away. And in our minds, we justify and rationalize this decision to not act, to just kind of withdraw for one reason or another. We don't know why, but the real reason behind our action is fear. Fear is sometimes very difficult to identify. We might think we're making a decision that is based on right versus wrong, when in reality, we've already given in to our fears and the outcome of this decision has already been decided. We're not even willing to consider the likely option of going. We just kind of go through the motions and ultimately end up where we always have been, making that same non-risk-taking choice. We often deceive ourselves because there is an underlying fear that we may or may not see and we can't or we won't acknowledge. Yet, time and again, this fear prevents us from taking a risk, and it robs us of the opportunity that would in fact be a great decision and a great direction for us to go that God is encouraging us and leading us to take. But what is it that we fear? Why are we so fearful? Well, for some of us, it's failure and the rejection that comes with it. What if I try this new thing and it doesn't work? What if I try this new path and it doesn't work out again? What if all those doubts I have about myself that I've kind of pushed away are brought up and they're reconfirmed? I haven't had to deal with those thoughts and those feelings for years. And you know what? I really don't want to go down that path, dig those up, and have to go there and experience that rejection, that failure all over again. It's just easier to go a different path. For others of us, we're afraid of the hard work or the sacrifices we will have to make. I like my hobbies. I like my free time. If I took this risk, I'd have to give up my season tickets because of both the money and the time this new direction would take. Ouch, season tickets. Don't touch me there, God. Don't hit me in that. Or I'd have to go back to school and give up my evenings and hang out with a bunch of 20-somethings. And I'm, in, I'm a 50-something, and oh, that would be so embarrassing. And I don't know, I don't, but didn't do well at school my first time through. Am I going to do any better now? And some of us are just tired and weary. And we're very comfortable with the status quo that life has brought us. Yet the status quo is very unfulfilling. Taking this risk might open some new doors and reward us in the long run. But what if I take this step and it doesn't? What if it just leads to failure? And for others of us, we're just afraid of change. Anybody here not like change? Yeah, there's a bunch of folks here. We just don't like change. Change is scary. It's unpredictable. We don't do well with the unknown, and almost always risk requires us to change, and change brings about the unknown, and that just makes us freak out. We were having a discussion at our dinner table the other night about my beard and, and Julie cutting her hair, and one of our children goes, every time, you know, Papa, I didn't like that beard the first couple weeks because it was just different. And surprise, surprise, that is all of ours who is going to struggle with the idea of change. Used to object to every haircut Julie came home with. Some of us just don't like it. So 
So fear is our second and probably the bigger obstacle that we're going to face. Now, honestly, these are huge factors when you and I make decisions when any level of risk is involved. Because we are stubborn people, and we don't always look at things objectively. Can you imagine us not looking at something objectively, having, looking at it subjectively, having some motive when we enter in? Let me give a little credit. He's not asking for it. But my friend Steve Schrage, not perfect, but I admire him for his ability to look at an issue objectively. If I'm going to make fun of Steve for not smiling, I will affirm him for his desire to look at a situation wisely and objectively without the emotion tied in. It's important to realize, though, that right versus wrong and fear are not separate factors when making decisions. One's on a mental, logical level, one's on an emotional level, and they often intersect in the decision-making process, much to our ignorance or our denial. Chris Borland was trying to consider which risks are the right risks for him to take and which are the wrong risks. You kind of heard the debate. He has seen the long-term effects of concussions on football players, and he has talked with men who are currently suffering from these head injuries. He is afraid of the consequences to his health should he continue playing. He is assessing right and wrong, but fear is driving his decision-making. I'm not saying it shouldn't, but not acknowledging that fear is a decision-making factor would be a lie. On the other hand, had Chris Borland grown up on the streets in poverty, and he had seen and lived and experienced what true poverty is like, and he'd seen his family grow up and live in this dangerous world where poverty is rampant. It is possible that the fear of ending up living there or seeing his family end up living there, seeing his children, his nieces, his nephews end up growing up there could be the risk factor that drives him to put his health on the line so that he can make the money, so that he can rescue his family and friends from that type of life. Do you see that? Do you see how a different person, a different experience, and the fears different, and they impact us right and wrong decision-making differently. So, how can we overcome these obstacles? Well, God knows we are human, and he is fully aware of our struggles in this area. Those of you who are struggling with risky, potentially risky decisions, God is fully aware that you struggle, and you know what? It makes him sad, but He's not too bothered by it because he has something for you in that. Even when he is calling us to take a risk, he knows full well how these obstacles are going to hinder us, how they're going to get in our way. Yet God has not left us without recourse, for he has given us his Holy Spirit as his followers, as his children, and he has given us some very powerful and effective means to begin overcoming these obstacles. You and I have been given everything we need to overcome these obstacles through the spirit that God has placed in us through faith in Jesus Christ. So, what are these means? Well, we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about them, and there's three of them. The first, of course, but they don't alliterate. The first, sorry, ah, uh, Matt will be back in August. He can get back to the alliteration. The first is wisdom. God gives wisdom. Throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament, God tells us time and again that there is godly or heavenly wisdom that comes from him and that he offers freely to us. This wisdom is real, it's effectual, and it is necessary. Wisdom is not to be confused with intelligence or even knowledge. Both of those are byproducts of our humanity. Intelligence is often part of our DNA. Just God gave some people a better brain than others. And some people really like to flaunt that better brain in really arrogant ways and make us not like them in the process. But nonetheless, it's kind of what's doled out at birth. Knowledge is often a byproduct of effort or study. You don't have to be a super intelligent person to be very knowledgeable. It can help, but knowledge often comes from study and applying ourselves to the pursuit of that knowledge. Wisdom, however, godly wisdom, spiritual wisdom is different. It only comes from God. 
also, this wisdom isn't just there for us to take like a buffet that's kind of moving around with us as we go about our daily life. But God gives this wisdom to us through our seeking him for it. God gives you and I wisdom, his wisdom, godly wisdom, as a byproduct of us being in relationship with him. And he offers it freely to anyone who will seek after it. It's a couple great verses. If you don't know these, I would encourage you to write these down, to memorize these, to kind of put these in your brain. The first is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, all your ways, not some of your ways, not half of your ways, not your, your, your daytime ways, not your nighttime ways, but in all your ways, in all your doings, acknowledge him. Seek to acknowledge God, to invite him, to give, throw it up to him. God, do you have anything you want to say to me before I walk into this store? No? Okay. Then walk into the store. But you've acknowledged him. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And what? He will make your paths straight. This is wisdom. This is a supernatural gift that God gives as we enter into relationship with him. Cognitive, daily, moment by moment, interaction with God. I am dependent on you in this moment. I'm about to see this person I haven't talked to in six months. I need your help, God. Give me wisdom. And he's there. And he will provide. But it comes through relationship. The second verse, one of my life verses, learned it when I was a kid in Sunday school, is James 1.5, and it says this, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. He offers wisdom, but he just doesn't give it. He gives it what? When they ask God. Do you want wisdom? Do you want to know how to proceed? Have you hit a dead end? You're not sure what kind of career decision to make. You're not sure what kind of family decision to make. Maybe you're thinking about adoption or fostering. You're not sure, and you've got risks and rewards on both sides. Stop and ask the Lord. I need wisdom, Lord. James 1.5 promises you will give it. Please direct me according to your will. And I don't know of any instances in that where a decision, a leading of God was not given. It may take a while. God may tend you on a path, may teach you a couple things, may grow you up in him, but I don't know of a situation where a person has not received the wisdom from God that they need and desire. The second component, thing, effect, means that God gives us to overcome our obstacle is courage. Yes, not surprising, courage. And courage moves from the kind of right decision, wrong decision, where wisdom tends to, to occupy and help with, and courage, rather, it addresses what obstacle? Fear. Courage is the antidote for fear. 31 times in the Bible, the term be strong is used. You type in be strong in, the, in the, just in Corinth 31 times. Old and New Testament, you hear the term be strong. And it's speaking of a courage. If you add be strong and courageous into the word search, 14 times in this book, 14 times the phrase be strong and courageous is written in this book, Old and New Testament. God is asking us to be people of courage, where we see ourselves as fearful, as we see ourselves as timid, as wallflowers, as we see ourselves as kind of secondary individuals in a conversation or in the world and, and the aggressive people seem to get all the, all the benefits and rewards. God is calling you and I to be people of courage, especially when we face risks that he has designed and brought into our life. Deuteronomy 31.6, which is God speaking to the people of Israel before they're about to leave uh, the desert and enter into the, the promised land where it's very ruthless and there are powerful cities and armies that they're going to have to go against, he says this, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. God goes with you and he will not leave you or forsake you. Who? 
goes with me? The Lord your God. Now, some of us say the words, but we don't comprehend the meaning. Lord and God are pretty powerful characteristics. And if when we say these words, we say we're going to believe these words, then we must realize that he who is with us, he who is for us, as it says in Romans 8, is greater than he who is in the world. If our God is for us, then no one can stand against us. Also, in Joshua 10, 25, a little bit later, as they've entered into the promised land, in the next book after Deuteronomy, Joshua records this, And Joshua said to them, Do not be afraid or dismayed. Be strong and courageous, for thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. Having defeated an army against the odds, he reminds them, Thus will God do to all your enemies against whom you fight, but you must be courageous. Is God coming to your rescue when you are facing your earthly enemies today? Question I have for you. You might say, no, I don't see God here. I don't see God coming to my rescue. Are you standing in courage against them? It very well could be that God wants you to take a step of faith in courage, and he's waiting to eradicate the enemies that stand before you, but he needs you to trust him and to step into your situation believing that he is God. Courage is essential. We talked about it last week, the courage of David before Goliath covered over so much ridiculousness on the part of that man. And he's, called, he's, he's, he's one of the greats as the Bible references him. Psalm 27, 14 is a third verse on courage. It says this, Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. For some of us, the risk is not running away. We face a situation and God's kind of redirected our world and we're in the middle of something and, ah, I don't want to be here. This is scary. This is crazy. And our, our normal modus operandi will be to run away. It's not that we have to do something. We simply have to not flee. And this verse is for us. This verse is for you. Wait for the Lord. Let him do the thing he's doing. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Courage and essential means that God has liberally provided for us in him. However, some of us here this morning, even though we love God, even though we know his word, we're like the lion and the wizard of Oz, and we do lack courage. We should have courage because we're a lion, we're a Christian, we're a follower, and yet we lack courage. Elijah, our th almost three-year-old, the curly-haired kid with the big face and all that, um, he's afraid of a lot of stuff. He's afraid of automatic flushing toilets in public restrooms. Some of you have kids might know that. He always asks me, Papa, please don't let him flush. Please don't let him flush. He's afraid of lightning and thunder. He even sees a lightning flash through the blind, and it's, it's a long night's sleep for him. And he's afraid of the part of taking a bath where you pour water over their head to rinse them. Something happened two years ago. It was very traumatic. Two years later, he's still horrified of getting water poured on his head. And to help Elijah through his fears, we have a saying in the Zilke house, or at least I have a saying, and it's this. I be brave, and he repeats, I be brave, and then I say, I be strong. And he goes, I be strong. And then we say it together. I be brave, I be strong. I be brave, I be strong. And I can see him in his mind thinking, yeah, I be brave, I be strong. And it actually works a little bit until I get the bucket of water I got to pour, and then he kind of loses it and cries again. But in the moment, it helps him overcome his fear. Some of us here this morning need to take our eyes off of ourselves and how we perceive things. And we need to look to the Lord and to his promises, who we say he is, who he says he is, which is even more important. And we need to say in confidence that he is with us. I be brave. I be strong. It's simply what it needs to be. We've got to stand in the face of our fear and say, I be brave and I be strong. Courage. However, there are times when human resolve, when I be brave and I be strong, are not enough. Even as we hear the promise, even as we come this morning, we worship God in our hearts, we can still 
We still can't seem to take that risky step. What we don't realize is that our lack of courage isn't so much a lack of resolve and us not just doing it, but there's a deeper issue at play, a deeper and more debilitating problem is present. The issue is actually not courage, but it's the issue of trust. And I love the Lord because he recently gave a very clear view of this. The Zilke kids, the first three, were very quick swimmers. Jonathan was jumping off the diving board into the water before he knew it. I saw him going, Papa, look at me. And I'm on the other side of the pool, and I had to swim because he's, he's going down, and I have to run after him. And David and Caroline both learned how to swim. But Zeke, Zeke's our thinker. Zeke's our contemplator. He'll sometimes just go to the porch and just watch things. I used to call him the watcher. And Zeke, for whatever reason, he'd love to go to the pool and love to play, but he would never let go of the side. I tried, I tried, I tried. He would never let me teach him how to swim. This year, finally gave in and we paid for swimming lessons. Oh, such a shot to my pride. Fine, if I can't do it, then somebody else will. But I went to the swimming lessons and I watched. And one of the things Zeke couldn't do was float on his back. I'm like, okay, he's doing better here. He's this, maybe me, maybe I stress him out too much. I don't mean to be one of those dads. I'm sorry if I am. Zeke, I'm sorry if I am. But, but nonetheless, I can help him float on his back. So we got him at the pool, uh, neighbor pool, the night of one of the swimming lessons, and he just has to learn to relax. And I'm holding Zeke. He will not relax. Every time I send him on the back, he lunges for me. I'm like, no, Zeke, you can trust me. I'm going to hold you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's lunging for me. He will not. He will not. Julie steps up to try to, he lunges for her. He won't just float on his back. But does Zeke not love me? Does Zeke not think affectionately of me? Have I hurt Zeke as a father? Have I, have, I irre- have I irreparably wounded you, son? No, he tells you no. Then why? Zeke, in his mind, doesn't trust me. The fear of what could happen to him if he let go, laid back in the water, even though I am his father and have done nothing but prove myself to him throughout his life, he doesn't trust me. Is Zeke a bad son because he doesn't trust me? No. He just is thinking. It's immature. It's not clear. It's not based in truth. He doesn't realize I can hold him, especially in the water. I can hold him up regardless. I'm not going to go, ah, I got you, dunk. I wouldn't do that to Zeke. Jonathan, I do it all day. But Zeke, I wouldn't do that to him. But in his mind, Zeke loves, but he doesn't trust. And how many of us love, worship, follow, do all we can with God, but when push comes to shove, when God says, lay on your back in the water and trust that my hands are going to hold you up, lunge for him, lunge for the side, and we won't do the thing he's asking us to do because deep down we love him, but we don't trust God. We don't trust him. And trust is different than love. Trust is surrender. Trust is, I have nothing to worry about, God. You got me. I'm, I'm in your hands. You're not going to do anything to harm me. I don't have to control. I don't have to, to be my own God. I can just rest in your arms. That's why we struggle with courage sometimes, because we struggle with trust. And trust is one of those weird, kind of hard-to-touch things, but it's so crucial our relationships and especially how we relate to God. And so this morning, if you're struggling to trust, I want to invite you to repent. Your trusting is not a byproduct of God's brokenness. It's a product of our and your brokenness. And here at Rooftop, do we celebrate being perfect or do we try to celebrate brokenness? We try to celebrate our failures, our shortcomings, and our brokenness. And if you find yourself not willing to trust God, my question for you is this. Have you repented of that? Have you gone before the Lord and said, Lord, I don't trust you. I am so sorry. I want to trust you, but I don't trust you. Will you help me? Will you forgive me? Will you cleanse me? Have you gone to your small group? Have you gone to the elders? Have you sought people out who can intercede for you that your heart will be healed, that you will know what it means to actually trust and to follow? Because that is what is available here today. That's available right here. Look around. People will intercede, will come to your aid, and will help you heal. 
in this area of trust, which so many of us are wounded with regard to God. We need wisdom. We need courage. And we need to learn how to trust. Let's stop deceiving ourselves that we think we got these things down. Some of us are back A, B, C, one, two, three with regard to some of this stuff, and, we, and that's okay. And we need God to walk us through the growing process. So as I close this morning, my question is simply this, which is it for you? Which of these obstacles is your big one? It might be all three to some level, but is there one? Is there one of these three that you're short and that you're deficient and that you need to seek the Lord regarding? I encourage you, act on that. Act on that. Find somebody. Talk to a friend, small group leader, pastor, somebody that you trust and say, okay, this is my issue. How can I grow? How can I heal? The Lord is waiting with potential rewards that you can't even imagine if and when you're willing to do that and therein take the risk.